wonderful company in Berkeley. We literally could not have planned this timing better. Uh, 24 hours ago, they announced their Series B round. Um, I wish we could have planned this, but um, it just happened by coincidence. Um, he is here to talk about uh, fundraising lessons and other lessons associated with, uh, with growing a startup from zero to nothing. Please give it up for Anand Kukarni. So thanks very much for that kind introduction, um, especially the part where you said how successful we are. But uh, I'll also say that for those of us who are entrepreneurs and those of us who uh, are building companies, success really doesn't start with fundraising. Uh, it uh, starts with uh, the exit for building something big. And fundraising is an important milestone along that journey. So uh, it's important to Think about it, talk about it, understand how it works, but uh, it's not the, the measure of success. At the end of the day, it's building great companies that matter. Um, so before we begin, maybe we could take a quick poll of hands so we know who's in the room. Who in here is a, uh, an entrepreneur, a founder, or a, a planned founder? A whole bunch of us, great. And then who is uh, on the investment side? Who is a funder? Great. And uh, folks in the ecosystem? Um, service providers, great. Uh, all, all important vital parts of the community. Um, well, great, so uh, as we said, I'm the founder, uh, co-founder of Lead Genius. Um, we're a five-year-old technology startup based in Berkeley. We're also a social enterprise, uh, and that's a little bit of an unusual combination because we have our DNA uh, in academia, in crowd computing, but we also have uh, strong product sensibilities in the sales technology and marketing technology world. Um, and we didn't always live in the sales technology and marketing technology world. We got here over many years, and I'll tell you three things today. Um, first, I'll tell you about what we do at Lead Genius right now um, and how we got to where we are today. Uh, next, I'll talk a little bit about how the fundraising experience went for us. And we didn't just raise uh, the Series B round that we raised uh, or announced yesterday. We actually have raised four rounds of funding. Um, I've come out to the market four times, and uh, three of those times were pretty hard. Uh, and one time was not, and I'll tell you why. And then I'll tell you the lessons learned. Um, some of the stories that we had, some of the takeaways that we had that hopefully will be valuable for entrepreneurs, and that will spur some discussion. And then after that, we'll have a little time for Q&A. Okay. Well, great. So, um, Lead Genius. Um, today we are a 50-person uh, strong company based in Berkeley. Um, we're just over on University Avenue, uh, right above what used to be uh, Perdition Barbecue and Grill. Um, <laughs> we um, are in the account-based marketing sales technology world. What that means is this. You, as a customer, are trying to get more business. You have prospects that you want to find. Um, you want to sell those prospects. Historically, what you would do is hire a big sales staff, um, buy a subscription to something like data.com or some other list of people, and you would have your salespeople go through and cold call each one of those people, or nowadays cold email each one of those people to say, hey, we're making this thing, do you want to buy it? I think you should buy it. And um, you get a lot of hangups, you get a lot of people who are just saying, you know, I don't want to talk to you again, please don't email me again in the future, dot, dot, dot. Um, and it's very expensive and you waste a lot of people's time, including your own salespeople's time and money. Um, so Lead Genius builds technology that solves that problem uh, for our customers. We have a solution that we call uh, account-based marketing technology. What that means is that we can figure out all the potential buyers in a given market, um, identify the right people inside the companies to talk to. Um, we can send personalized direct communication to those people from our customer salespeople, and then we can monitor and analyze the responses that come back to figure out which pieces, uh, which people are saying, yes, I'm interested, let's talk, and figure out which people are saying, no, I don't want to talk to you. Um, so it's a way to try and automate, accelerate, and um, really uh, improve the sales process. Um, our customers today are mostly on the enterprise side, um, brand names are like Staples, Box, Google, eBay. Um, we sell a lot of fast-growing startups too. Uh, Weebly and Stripe are probably the best known in that bunch. And then we've done a whole bunch of small startups before that too. Um, so that's where we are today. Um, pretty healthy revenue. 
um, enough to support 50 people and to raise a $10 million Series B. Um, we didn't start in this universe, uh, and we didn't start in this universe by any stretch of the imagination. Um, five years ago when we launched this business, I was a PhD student at UC Berkeley in the Department of Industrial Engineering. My two co-founders were in the School of Information doing masters, um, and we were working on a, a, a very different problem, which was the problem of how you could create jobs for people who were extremely poor, living at the bottom of the economic pyramid um, in slums in India. And that's about as far away from sales technology as you can get, um, since these are individuals who had no idea um, what SaaS was, let alone um, where they were going to get uh, enough money for the, the next day. So uh, we met in a class, my co-founders and I, that was focused on uh, information computing technology for people who were at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, trying to figure out ways to build businesses that were uh, for-profit enterprises that were serving these groups. And the for-profit distinction was super important because we wanted to build businesses that were sustainable under their own power, that could get to really big scale, and that could try and uh, last beyond the course of a, um, a round of charitable investment or a grant. Um, so day one we said, how do we build something that's going to reach a million people? And that was our target. Um, so that was interesting. That was uh, a bold challenge, especially for a bunch of students. Um, the first model that we built out was this idea that we could um, scrape low-paying digital jobs from the site Amazon Mechanical Turk, which, if you don't know it, is the service that lists these gig jobs on the internet, and you can um, uh, do them for a few pennies at a time. Um, we thought we'd give them to people on their mobile phones, we'd give them mobile phones, um, and so somebody would be in a slum, they would have a mobile phone, they would see a job show up on Mechanical Turk through our device, and then they would do the job, get a few cents, and uh, over time that would be enough money for them to survive. So that was the idea. Uh, we thought it was really great. Uh, we built a prototype technology uh, device, we built some software, we got a bunch of people in a slum in India, um, we had them start doing data entry work that we found for them. Um, and we started paying them a little bit of money, um, just out of our own pockets. Um, so this idea was totally nuts. It was so wrong uh, compared to what uh, the market actually would support. Um, there wasn't much work on Amazon Mechanical Turk, not nearly as much as we thought there were. There was, and nobody actually knew how to do that work. Um, people who were living in a slum didn't really have the right context for this kind of work. Um, but. Um, as an idea and as a model, we had convinced ourselves that we could take it a little further. We thought that we could actually build a company around this. Um, and um, that was actually enough for us to uh, get a very small grant from UC Berkeley, uh, just $4,000 uh, at the end of this course. And that was enough for us to believe that we should keep working on this uh, business and this idea. And actually the judges in that uh, course competition who decided to get the money was uh, one of them was uh, this guy right here, Wes Alpi from uh, Better Ventures. So um, we went on from there to do uh, an accelerator, uh, which was Hub Ventures, um, which was the predecessor fund to Better Ventures. Worked there for about four months, um, trying to experiment with different business models around the same idea. Um, and at this point, we didn't have any funding besides this four four thousand dollars, right? Um, which was really not much to uh, survive on. But we were students, uh, so it wasn't a big deal. Um, and that's eventually how we got into our uh, uh, first attempt at a workable business model, which was this idea that we could um, build a replacement entirely for Mechanical Turk by finding people who were um, good at doing work inside this community. And we had to look a little bit higher than people who were living in a slum, but still people who were near the bottom of the pyramid. We got these folks to do work that we would find for them. So we went to people who we thought had big projects that would be easy to get out to people internationally on a mobile phone. Um, so we went to, for example, professors at Berkeley and said, hey, do you have any paperwork that needs to be typed up? Um, and a lot of people said no, um, but some people said yes. So we got our first project, which was a $600 project to digitize a whole stack of newspapers from uh, the 1800s for the economics department. Um, <laughs> And um, it turned out our business model was still kind of broken then because that's not really great work to put on a mobile phone. Um, and it wasn't really uh, work that our workforce really knew how to do very well either. 
Um, so we learned a lot trying to build a business um, serving that community in that way. We did eventually get the work done um, by bypassing our own technology and just emailing it to people who could go and give it out to folks on the ground and getting it typed up some other ways. Um, but we had a little bit of business and a little bit of money coming in. Um, so this was the first point where we had to seriously look at, at taking on funding. Um, because we were at the point where um, one of my co-founders was graduating, one of my co-founders was in a position where he could have gotten a, an internship, um, and uh, as a, a founder, I had to basically figure out a way to pay my team enough money to survive in the summertime uh, without necessarily uh, going off and getting some other jobs because we wanted to make this company uh, more successful. And this is a challenge that a lot of early stage entrepreneurs face because in the beginning you don't really know if what you have is a business or if what you have is just an idea. Everyone's always looking at other opportunities and there's this slim difference that sometimes exists only in your own mind about whether you're actually an entrepreneur or if you are unemployed. Um, so we, um, we managed to fall on the right side of that distinction. Um, because two things happened. The first was that we went to this bank. Um, we went to Standard Chartered Bank, which is this really old school British bank. And we asked them um, if they would take their secure financial documents, um, like loan applications and so on, that were being handwritten, and they would give them to us to send out to this uh, team of people who were really poor living in a slum in India. Um, <laughs> And they, they met with us and they heard us out, you know, they, they took us pretty seriously at the beginning and by the end they, they told us, guys, this idea is terrible, like, there's no way we can take financial documents and give them to people who are outside the country, um, it, you know, over unsecured mobile devices, dot, dot, dot. Um, but then the next day they called us back and they said, hey, you know, we didn't think your idea was that good, but we like that you're coming up with ideas and we really need some people who are innovative to share this space with us um, so we can bounce, they can bounce ideas off of us and come up with new proposals and ideas and notions. So they gave us this office space in, um, in Soma that was really fancy. And so we had this place where we were going into work every day. Um, we weren't paying rent, you know, they just let us hang out for a bit. Um, and the second thing was that we, um, we figured out ways to uh, systematically go after and uh, get funding. So at this point, we were in the what you might call the, the genesis stage of, of fundraising, right? We didn't really have much meaningful revenue. We didn't have product market fit, definitely. We didn't have much more than a team. Um, we had a team, and uh, we had some basic technology prototypes, um, and we had an idea. And we had some evidence that we knew how to get a little bit of cash showing up if we really needed to, but. Um, not enough. So at this point our options were grants. Um, uh, we did talk to some angels at this point, and then accelerators. Um, and the right answer for us at that point turned out to be accelerators. Um, angels, we could have pitched, and we talked to some folks who gave us good advice. They said, if you pitch an angel right now, you're going to be pitching them just on this vision, um, not based on numbers. And angels will invest based either on uh, hope or on numbers. <laughs> Um, and you're gonna make the hope pitch, um, which would have been a lot harder. Uh, but accelerators, especially people now, th at this point pre-seed wasn't really a big thing, but accelerators were filling that gap. Um, they were used to seeing groups that just had strong teams, um, decent ideas, and some room to explore. Um, so for us, the two accelerators that we ended up um, going into, one was um, Hub Ventures, the predecessor to Better Ventures, the other one was Y Combinator, um, and uh, both of those concluded with uh, uh, a demo day. But the important thing was that uh, we got a little bit of funding to start, start the business uh, through those accelerators. So um, the first takeaway is if you are in a phase where you have an idea, um, you have a notion, you don't necessarily have uh, a bunch of numbers or revenue to back it up, um, you're far better off talking to folks who are either at the pre-seed stage um, or who are uh, used to running accelerators because they will give you um, the kind of insight, opinions, advice, money um, that you need at that stage. Um, it would have been a mistake for us to go and try and raise from VC at that stage, obviously. It probably would have been difficult for us to raise from um, bigger angels. Um, 
groups that specifically say they want pre-seed companies or genesis stage companies, which exist now, those are the ones we, we uh, should have talked to. Um, but accelerators were also good. Um, okay, so the first round that we officially raised, um, not counting that, uh, that stage, was the round that we raised right after Y Combinator finished, which was summer of 2011. Um, and we came out of this uh, after having done a launch. We had launched a product during YC. It was, again, this different iteration of the product. Um, we ended up launching a version of this technology that was um, sort of this online digitization tool, right? Where you would send us, you would upload some pages of any kind of document you wanted to, and then we would send it to our community living at the bottom of the economic pyramid. They would type it up and send it back. So still that same idea. Um, and we launched this thing with big fanfare in the press, we thought, right? We stayed up all night working on our site, our messaging, dot, dot, dot. And then, um, like, the launch was pretty tepid. Um, a whole bunch of people wrote in and said, oh, this sounds cool, but not, it didn't have much in the way of traction, right? Not real traction. Um, people tried it out, took it for a spin. Um, people weren't giving us money to use the product, which was a problem. Um, except for one guy. One guy from Australia um, sent in this request and he's like, yeah, this doesn't really sound like what you guys are selling, but I wonder if you could do it anyway, because I think it'll work. I have this um, list of uh, names of people and I want to figure out um, where each of them work. Um, can you just fix, like, do this for me? So we said, well, you know, we really struggled with this um, from a conceptual basis. We said, this is really not what we sell. Um, this is not really what we want to do. And he said, well, yeah, I understand, but I really need this done, and I have $5,000. So, okay. So we won our $5,000, because we were trying to build a business. Um, so we said, okay, we'll do it. Um, and we, we ended up, um, not reading the writing on the wall. Instead, we, we subcontracted it out to somebody else and said, yeah, we'll get it done, just take the money. Um, but it turned out this was um, something we should have listened to. Uh, and this is the, the second takeaway, because this ultimately became our core business. Um, when the market is trying to pay you to do something, when people are saying, shut up, take my money, um, you should do that. <laughs> um, and you should think about whether your business is the right one, um, because this is a signal that actually mattered for us. When we raised that first round of funding, um, which was, I guess, our seed round, um, that was a slide that showed up on our, on our actual deck. We showed a, a deck of our growth at that point, our, our progress, and we basically had um, a chart that looked like this, right? Uh, with time in this direction, the launch date here, and revenue here, right? And we had like, we had basically um, two points on that slide. The zero point at the launch, and that $5,000 that we made, <laughs> and an arrow that went like this. Um, so we were making great progress, like, up to the right. Um, but that revenue was, was what mattered, and actually. It took us a while to come around to this idea that that was the market we should have been in all along, which was um, sales and marketing, data collection, and research. Uh, feeding that to the, the community that we had um, developed at the bottom of the market, which, uh, bottom of the pyramid, which was growing um, at that point quite considerably because there were a lot of people who actually needed jobs um, living in these communities. So um, we went out to raise a round. Um, we looked at a lot of companies that were graduating from Y Combinator with us. Some of these guys were experienced entrepreneurs. They were raising rounds that were millions of dollars with the ridiculous valuations. Um, and we said, well, how much should we raise? You know, there's just four of us. Um, we decided to raise, we said between 7 and 7 point, uh, excuse me, 750K and 1.5 million. Um, and we picked those numbers somewhat arbitrarily. Um, nowadays, we do math much better. We say how much we need for the next 18 months to get to our next milestone. But then we thought, okay, well, how much do we need to support ourselves and run some experiments for a little while? Um, that was a hard round to raise, um, and you can probably guess why. Um, we were trying to raise a lot of money without a lot of traction. Um, so there's a third takeaway. Investors generally look for three things, um, irrespective of your size, irrespective of the quantity you're trying to raise. They look for a team, they look for market, and they look for traction. Um, we had team, sort of, in the sense that we were all Berkeley graduate students, so we had a little bit of pedigree, but none of us had exited before, none of us had built companies before, uh, no real experience in that sense. We were domain experts in building technology for people who were poor, so there was something. Um, the market we were going after um, 
we thought was big. Um, the digitization of text was a big market. The outsourcing market was huge. We were taking a chunk of that. Um, today, of course, we talk about a market very differently. Today, we're looking at the sales and marketing technology market, which is um, a very large market. Um, and we can tell you exactly how large that is down to the dollar based on our analysis and estimates. Um, and the th third thing was traction. And we didn't have traction, um, not in any uh, big, meaningful sense. Um, so it was a tricky round. We put it together. Um, there were some ups and downs. We came in at the bottom end of that. We got 750K. Um, we burned through that money doing experiments over the course of the next 18 months or so. Um, most of those experiments were tricky. Um, some of them showed promise. Um, ultimately, we got to the point where we were nearly out of cash. Um, we had about three months, six months left, somewhere in that range. Um, we went to our early stage investors, our accelerators, and we said, hey guys, um, we're running out of cash. We think it's time to raise Series A. <laughs> Um, and uh, I remember this conversation we had with Paul Graham at YC really distinctly because uh, he looked at us and he's, the first thing he said is, you know, how's your, you know, what's your much monthly recurring revenue? And we said, well, we don't really have monthly recurring revenue <laughs> so much as we, you know, we, we've had some revenue. <laughs> and we went through our numbers and basically every time we told him our numbers, you know, his face got sadder and sadder. You know, he said, you guys realize if you go and raise right now, you're going to be in the bottom tenth, like the bottom the bottom ten percent of companies who are trying to raise funds. Um, and we're like, oh, but we didn't realize this basic fact about um, how fundraising is supposed to work in subsequent rounds, which is that um, you are taking money to try and explore a market and to prove out a market hypothesis that you can address, um, and. We had failed to basically demonstrate that there was a reproducible market that we could attack by spending money, um, let alone the fact that we hadn't achieved any of the milestones that we think would have been necessary for uh, um, trying to get into uh, a Series A level. Um, and I can share some of those numbers that I think is relevant, uh, that I think would be relevant if we were raising Series A again. Um, so we've been in the business one last time. Uh, the last bit was a big success. We figured out a way to have subscription-based labor um, for people who wanted to um, hire our workforce directly to help them with lead generation. Um, and that business model turned out to be super successful. Uh, revenue was doubling for every month for the next, uh, um, I think the next three months or something, or the next four months. So we had this great um, traction. We were doing, by the end of it, I think 80K MRR. Um, and then we went out to raise again. And we didn't do a Series A. Uh, we did what we called a Series AA, which was basically a seed extension. And that was the easiest round we had ever raised because we were posting uh, four straight months of doubling revenue. Um, I think we went 10, 20, 40, 80. Um, so awesome trajectory um, and meaningful plan. And we raised from people who were trying to deploy relatively small amounts of cash. So we weren't going to people and saying, hey, we need a million dollar check. Um, we said, you know, give us 50K, give us 100K, give us 200K. And we filled up a round of um, about 1.2 million that time. So that was great. Um, that money took us to our Series A, where we really honed in on this focus of what was working. We learned this lesson that you should adapt to what the market is asking for. You should prove out experiments. You should follow the revenue. Um, and we did follow the revenue, and it worked. Um, so, back in 2014, we raised Series A, we went out under the name Lead Genius, which was the new product focus that we had gotten behind, where we would add in lots of technology to this workforce. So in addition to just helping you find leads using people, we would crawl big parts of the web, ingest that data, build a machine learning system that could sort out good data from bad, and then use the human workforce to try and fill in the cracks that the, human, uh, that the machine learning system couldn't get itself. Um, that worked well. That was a hard round to raise to. Um, we raised a six million dollar Series A, um, but we knocked on a lot of doors and we got a lot of people telling us no. Um, and it was interesting because this was the first time that we had seriously tried to raise money from um, so-called institutional capital, right? People who were um, sitting on, say, a $100 million fund or uh, a $200 million fund. Um, and we didn't really understand a lot of the dynamics that were in place when we first started trying to raise that round. Um, first off, we pitched it first as a labor business instead of as a software business. 
and um, that pitch changed over time. Um, we eventually got the pitch right, which was we're going to build this software company that's going to collect data at scale, and the workforce is part of it, and they're beneficiaries of this model, but they are not the, the only way to get this done. Um, and the reason that that was much better is that it implied we could get to scale quickly, which was true. Um, second, we, um, we didn't recognize the fact that um, the pitch would adapt as we practiced it more and gave it to more people and had more discussion with investors. I'm actually always curious if investors are aware of these dynamics that, you know, if your number, if your pitch number 50 in the, in the fundraising cycle, you're going to get a great pitch. And if your pitch number one, you're going to get a pretty rough version, even though it's the same entrepreneur. Um, but that was the case. And, you know, by the time we got to the, um, the pitches near the end, they were a lot better. Um, but that said, the bar for institutional fundraising, raising $6 million, was far higher than we ever thought it would have been. And at that point, we were doing, um, I think, one and a half million in annual revenue, so maybe more. Um, and uh, it was still a tricky, a very tricky process. Um, and this is the next lesson, is that institutional VCs have a, um, a return factor um, that they need to hit. And so they look for companies that can be really, really big, as opposed to companies that can just be modestly big. And by modestly big, that can sometimes mean $100 million in valuation or $300 million in valuation. People are looking for um, exits with these, depending on the size of the pitch, of the fund that you're pitching. Okay, um, the last round that we did, um, we just finished it, um, I would say about a month ago. Um, and uh, of course, at this point, we're a fairly mature company. We have good revenue. Um, we're growing quickly. We 6 x our revenue in the last 20 months um, since the Series A. So actually, that should have been great growth um, by any reasonable standard. Uh, we had the bad luck. And we actually had doubled revenue every year for the last three years. Um, we had the misfortune to uh, go out and, and raise our first meeting, uh, right when the market tanked. Our first meeting was the, um, with the VC was on the day in February when um, I think Marketo dropped in 50% value, it was LinkedIn, dropped 50% value um, in one day, um, which was not a great time to be pitching marketing companies. Um, and so it proved to be a tricky process. Um, I took some notes on exactly how hard it was uh, when I was reflecting on this, and we were analyzing it. We're very data-driven about our fundraising process now. Um, any guesses how long it took uh, to raise our round in months? Ten. Oh, okay. You guys are you guys are more pessimistic than I was. <laughs> it took us four and a half four and a half months. It took us 199 meetings. Um, what? Wow. I wouldn't guess that. Okay. Um, to to get everybody everybody lined up and on board. Um, but of course, we actually got great investors this round. We got great investors last round, and we actually got great investors in our first rounds too. So um, I'll also say that it was all worth the effort because we got people who are really amazing and who have been awesome partners to us, um, Wes included actually, who was uh, better ventures in this, in this last round in a big way too, um, along with uh, um, more conventional technology uh, investors. So. Um, yeah, that's the, the story of how we got here. There were lessons interspersed. Um, I think we have some time for Q&A, so great. So um, we can field some questions, and I can go into any of this that uh, was particularly interesting. And then there's some questions out on the board, actually. Okay, what was the biggest, like, if we can jump into this, or we can, are there questions from the audience that didn't go into Slido yet? Okay, we'll start with the Slido ones. Um, okay, what was the biggest challenge in raising your round? Well, which round? Um, Let's say the let's say uh, the most recent round, right? Um, Ten million Series B. Um, okay, this one we were affected, in my opinion, pretty badly by market dynamics. Um, a lot of people were a little skittish about investing in marketing technology, um, just because of the state of, of how a lot of the outcomes had been for Marketo and LinkedIn. Um, everyone wanted to talk to us, so we were getting introductions to the right people. They were always warm. We got inbound interest too. Um, and we always got the first meeting. Um, we usually got the second. And we always got the second meeting too. But getting stuff over the hump um, was really about the numbers. At Series B, it's a growth ramp. So they dug in pretty hard on the numbers. Sometimes they liked it, sometimes they didn't. So 
Um, what was your pre-money valuation on that round, and what was your revenue that they were basing the numbers on? Yeah, so we didn't disclose the valuation for this round, but I will tell you, um, here's one more lesson. I'll give you our pre-money valuation in our seed round, um, which was the first round we did right out of Y Combinator in 2011. Um, first, I'll give you the lesson, which is you shouldn't shoot for a high valuation. <laughs> um, it's the wrong thing to optimize for, and the investors in this room will probably agree with me, um, because it did... It was corrected in the last round to some extent, um, but I will say that it wasn't a down round, of course. You know, growth has been great, but um, valuations are more sane nowadays. Um, but we raised uh, a valuation that was probably too high in our um, convertible note, which um, you know meant we had to go further. Um, but um, that wasn't the challenge, actually. Yeah, the, the, the valuation wasn't the sticking point for investors. And generally, you'll find that if people like the deal enough, sometimes the valuation will be the issue, but uh, more often than not, it's, uh, it's something that just has to be adjusted for. Um, so the biggest challenge in raising the round. Um, the biggest challenge, I think, was the market at the time. Um, you know, that was the, the factor that we ended up um, grappling with the most. Um, our story was pretty good through the process. Hopefully that answered the question. In the earlier rounds, it was different, right? In the first, the places where it was hard to raise, the first time we didn't have traction, so mm. that was a mistake. Okay. Um, another thing that we did that we didn't notice um, really well, um, I'll get to this, I'll, I'll make one last point about this. One thing we didn't realize was that you have to pitch the right kind of investor. And when I say the kind of investor, people think about sector focus a lot, like, okay, I'm building a social enterprise, I should pitch social VCs, I'm building a healthcare enterprise, I should pitch healthcare VCs. And that's true, but it's also about the, the size of the fund. Because if you're pitching somebody who is writing $5 million checks and um, sitting on a $200 million fund, they make a very small number of investments every year, and they're not gonna, they'll take meetings a lot of times with um, people just with ideas, but they're probably not gonna write a check. Um, whereas people who are angels um, will write you a check, or accelerators, or people who are in the money, the business of doing pre-seed or seed uh, meeting, uh, investing. So I just like to make a comment about that. So I'm in venture capital, and venture capitalists you know, now also, they have like core investments for the larger checks, but they also save enough money to make seed investments and hope people will graduate to be a core investment. So you can still pitch the venture capital firms if you want a little bit less. Yeah, that's that's very true. And there are funds that um, I think specialize in, they, they'll sometimes name this idea too. Um, but I'll say that you should make sure that the fund you're pitching has that particular interest and you should make sure they've done deals like that before. Because um, angels we found very, very willing to write us checks with very little um, process. Um, whereas VCs, even at the large stage, um, even for some small investments, put us through a lot of process. In the process of raising money during these phases, <coughs> can you give the um, the current entrepreneurs a, an idea on how to best preserve equity for the founders as you're going through the process? Yeah, sure. So the rule of thumb that I've always heard is um, you give up no try and give up no more than twenty five percent in each round. Simple as that. Thank you. I mean. Talk to the VCs in here to get other opinions too. Um, the biggest chunk of equity you'll give up is to your co-founders. Is was my experience. So that's uh, why we shouldn't have optimized for valuation. We should have optimized for co-founders. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I don't love my co-founders. Without whom the business wouldn't be where it is today. So, um, were you worried that your idea was fail? How did you approach these moments? Yes. So every entrepreneur goes to this idea, uh, goes to this phase. You're always up at night wondering what, what happens if you don't make it. Um, so there's always this challenge in personal psychology to try and manage your own um, doubts or worries about the business, especially as a founder. Um, in the beginning, we were, um, it was difficult for us. We just sort of white knuckled it through, the, through those moments. We had a lot of confidence in ourselves, but you never know, right? um, especially when money is tight. Um, there are a couple of approaches you can take. The one I recommend now is you, uh, get a founder coach or executive coach or a peer group of other founders. And good investors, especially at the early stage, will have a network of existing portfolio, company, portfolio companies with CEOs you can talk to, um, all of whom are uh, good people to speak with, especially if they're one stage ahead of you. Um, let's see. How did you get doors to open when you didn't have revenue? 
Was it just perseverance or did you smile a lot? Um, <laughs> The answer is warm intros. Um, almost always it's warm intros. Um, you should talk to people who those companies have invested in and try and get them to introduce you to those individuals. Um, perseverance sort of matters, but um, it matters when you're doing sales a lot. Um, I don't know that it will help with VC because I think investors are in the business of evaluating investments and um, you know, when somebody's not interested, the best thing they'll tell you is no. It doesn't have, you won't change that note of a yes by continuing to email and call them. Um, unless something has changed materially about the business. Like, go back in a year, everybody told us no in our seed round, definitely wanted to meet with us again at the A round and the B round. So, um, make sure things have changed. But yeah, perseverance, um, it, it helps, but start with warm intros to VCs. Okay, how important is having revenue and landing your Series B? So, and has the minimum amount of revenue gone up? Um, so I'll give you the rule of thumb that I've heard for Series A. I don't know what the rule of thumb is for Series B. Um, but um, Series A, I've heard you need to have 100K in revenue um, monthly, um, and you want to have a projection that you can get to 5 million um, in the next milestone. Um, that's just a random rule of thumb that I heard. So I don't know if it's true or not. Um, but I'll also say that lots of companies have models that don't need revenue, right? You can get to large scale without having a whole bunch of money coming in. Um, and if you're going that route, then it doesn't apply. What you do need to have in any case is traction, right? And that can be traction through growth, rapid user count, so on. Um, these rules of thumb always vary. Um, plenty of companies raise without having those metrics with different metrics, but you need to have big progress. Revenue unlocked more doors for us than anything else. So whenever I advise early stage startups and they're thinking about, oh, do I go this way? Do I go the, you know, free route and make money later, um, it's much easier to go the revenue route. Because if you don't get capital infusions, then you can always just you know, spend your revenue to grow your business. Okay, um, slow down on the economy. One last question, and then I'll uh, answer the rest uh, in person. Um, is there a slowdown in the economy? Has that affected purchases of your product? Good question. Um, so we're selling to the sales and marketing side, um, and companies need growth no matter what. So it's been relatively recession-proof, um, although we're not in a recession yet, even if there were one. Um, there's a, always a story you can tell, which is that lead genius is far cheaper than hiring a sales and marketing staff. Usually the story that people tell is lead genius will help us grow our way uh, out of any slowdown, so spend more on lead genius. Um, that's <laughs> fortunate for us. Um, great, um, and these two questions, if you come talk to me, um, I'm happy to answer them. All right, thanks a lot. Great talk. Leverage is the end of the program.